Our book, The First Principles of Philosophy, was written somewhat over 20 years ago. And it is inevitable that in the years of research that followed after the publication of the work, some points of interest should arise, and uh, a discussion of this kind, of the kind of commentary or addenda to the original work, is probably useful and uh, reasonably meaningful. Our first branch of philosophy is called metaphysics. And I think we have to realize that in ancient times, the term philosophy itself extended over a very large part of ancient learning, including many subjects that have since been divided into specialized fields. Essentially, the foundation of philosophy is the metaphysical part. Thus, in nearly all ancient systems, it is placed first as the primary or groundwork for the entire study of philosophy. The term metaphysics comes from the Greek and means, rather simply, beyond physics. Beyond, in this case, means further from the appearances or the material aspects of things. It means beyond the ordinary researches into the mysteries of nature and the formal studies and of the phenomenal universe which we inhabit. It may be said briefly that metaphysics deals with the hidden parts of physical procedure. It was known and recognized by the ancients that all visible things flowed from invisible sources. All nature was supported upon invisible foundations. Life itself, though infinitely manifest in its diversity, is concealed and unknowable in its origin. Metaphysics, therefore, covers the invisible origins of things which gradually move into a visible state. And it may also be said to be concerned with other things not only invisible in origin, but remaining invisible, having no exact manifestation on the material plane of life. The first uh, philosopher of distinction to devote a complete work to the study of metaphysics was Aristotle. And as we study his remarkable volume, his name, The Metaphysics, we realize, perhaps more fully than in any other of his writings, the extraordinary genius of the man. We come to know clearly that Aristotle did not deny the existence of a transphysical universe. He did not for a moment question the secret fountains from which all manifestations flow. He did, however, take the basic attitude that there is no interruption of what might be termed the grand pattern of physics. Metaphysics was therefore the better part of physics itself. It was not a separate study or a separate consideration, but merely the extension 
of physical knowledge toward the world of causes, where things are less obvious or evident, more difficult to measure and to estimate. Perhaps Lord Bacon summarized Aristotle's position rather well when he said that when physics properly understood, there will be no further need for metaphysics. In other words, these two terms cover the hemispheres of a single sphere. Metaphysics is nothing more nor less than the orderly extension of the universe back toward its own cause. Man attempting to understand, attempting to rationalize uh, those parts of the creative processes which do not directly uh, come within the area of the sense perceptions. Aristotle would have taken the position that if man was able suddenly to open new eyes within himself and was able, therefore, to observe the universe with more skillful or adequate faculties, he would find that there was no break between the visible and the invisible. What we call the break is the boundary of our own sensory perceptions. It has nothing to do with the orderly structure of the universe itself. Also, there was nothing in the classical concept of metaphysics that can be compared with the popular usage of the term as we so often find it today. Today, metaphysics has become a synonym for a kind of liberal religious mysticism. This is not actually contrary to the meaning of the word, but it certainly does not fully explain it. Nor are the various religious sects which regard themselves as metaphysical are devoted to the primary objects of this branch of philosophy. Metaphysics is not a faith any more than physics is a faith. Metaphysics is an area for research. But we are not able to use in this area the same instruments with which we carry on our exploration of the hemisphere of physics. We cannot use the equipment that is set up to measure things that are tangible, that have immediately recognized dimension, that can be captured in various experiments or made known to us by the cunningly contrived instruments and devices which we have gradually perfected. Therefore, we have only one essential way of exploring the area of metaphysics, and that is by the reasoning power of the mind. Now, the reasoning faculty is again something uh, which we do not too greatly understand. Reason is not acceptance, nor is it belief, nor is it faith, nor can it be regarded as a form of superstition. As Plato points out to us, reason is an instrument. Reason is just as certainly a scientific instrument as the telescope or the microscope. But both of these instruments have to be skillfully prepared. And if the telescope is not made by one thoroughly versed in the production of such instruments, it will be faulty and probably of very little value. In the same way, reason, unless it is cultivated, unless its processes are sharpened by clarity of thinking, can do very little to help us to discover the reasonable. The end of reason is to discover that which is reasonable. We say reasonable because we cannot, uh, within the proprieties of philosophy or science, say the discovery of that which is true. 
We have every reason to believe that if we can be completely reasonable, we will arrive at truth. But we are not sure that man is capable of perfect reason, any more than we are sure that he is capable of creating a perfect device or, if, or even an infallible instrument. Every instrument device that we have ever created, we have improved down through time, even after we believed that we had reached a degree of perfection in which no further improvement was probable. It is the same with the reason. No matter how skillfully we train it, no matter how judiciously we use it, we realize that we are working with a living faculty or power, that this is an instrument subject to growth subject to improvement in and of itself, and also that it belongs to a being continually evolving, continually increasing in insight and knowledge, and enlarging the areas of its skill. Thus, we can say with more or less conviction that that which is reasonable nearly always proves to be true, but this is not infallible. But then there is nothing in knowledge that is infallible. Reason permits us to explore areas where the faculties which we commonly employ cannot penetrate. But reason does not permit us to come into conflict with common sense, nor does it enable us to assume that any extension from the known and from the visible shall be in conflict with the known and the visible. We do not find such conflict in nature. We find that all things are suspended from their proper causes, that these causes are consistent with the effects which they produce, and the effects in turn bear witness to their causes. We learn, however, by the use of reason that it is possible to estimate the nature of many causes by a consideration of the effects suspended from them. Thus we come to the point of, of the Aristotelian philosophy, the a posteriori concept, that from the study of effects we may come finally to participation in the nature of causes. This uh, use of the reason uh, to explore the area of metaphysics uh, re usually requires that we have a profound judgment, a skillful and adequate training, uh, that we are fully equipped with what is known on the subjects which we investigate and that therefore we do not regard metaphysical insight as in any sense of the word uh, something that takes the place of knowledge, something that is better uh, than the reasonable faculties, rather that it is the best way that we have of using the total power to know which we possess. Reason, therefore, becomes our all-sufficient guide. And by means of it, uh, we come to certain conclusions. These conclusions uh, have stood, uh, stood the test of ages. And while in various periods of history, that which is reasonable has been assailed and declared to be beyond demonstration, the world in the end always returns to the reasonable, referring it even to the factual. The reason for this is that the factual, as we understand it today, has a quality of sterility about it. Facts are for the most part static. They are not dynamic. One of the reasons for this is that the facts that we are able to comprehend are terminal facts. 
There is much that precedes them, but very little that follows after them. Therefore, to possess facts does, uh, does not mean that we have keys which open new doors. We have only the, the power or the privilege or the ability to contemplate these things which we have observed. And from this contemplation come finally to the same conclusions that we originally held. Thus, facts are not exceptionally stimulating. And very few facts have great solution and value. These facts become the obvious thing. And around the structure of the obvious, we build an almost total indifference. Facts, therefore, have a tendency to blunt our interests. Uh, they cause us to substitute the obvious for the reasonable. They disincline us to effort, investigation, and the arduous pursuit of knowledge. Possessing what we call facts, we feel that we have the better part of knowing, and therefore falsely assume that our knowledge is complete. The difference between facts, therefore, and things reasonable must always be that we are seeking not merely for that which is evident, but for those causes which explain the evidence. Reason, therefore, is forever seeking the reason for things, the reason for conditions, the reason for circumstances. And the training the reason becomes dynamic because it causes us to be attentive to the conditions or circumstances which are prior to the obvious. We may, therefore, say that history will tell us that in 1492, uh, Columbus, shall we say, contacted the Western Hemisphere. This fact, however, is of small, vital knowledge. It can be memorized and forgotten. But behind this fact itself is the tremendously dramatic story of the circumstances which led to the voyages of Columbus. These voyages were in effect, the cause of which lay deeply hidden in the complications of European statescraft, in the opinions and attitudes of men, in the prejudices and intolerances of the time, in ancient traditions, and in old records that we scarcely ever bother to examine. Thus, facts are like icebergs the greater part of the important value being submerged. And metaphysics must deal with the study of these submerged or invisible factors, without which visible things have little or no essential meaning. It is obvious, therefore, that uh, to work into the research of a metaphysical nature, we have to become explorers of a difficult and sometimes dangerous country. We have to leave behind many familiar things, but always trusting upon principles. We must advance our studies systematically, thoughtfully, reasonably, cautiously, and yet at the same time with no arbitrary restrictions imposed by prejudice or intemperance or intolerance of attitude. Thus, metaphysics is really that part of learning which man some way most favors, because it is his only way of trying to explain himself, trying to find out where he came from, the reason for his own existence, the true nature of the universe in which he lives, the laws which govern creation itself, the energies which abide in space, all of these uh, imponderable values cannot be reached by the common processes of knowledge. They belong, therefore, to the sphere of metaphysics. And with this realization, we see how rich this sphere is.
how meaningful it can be, but how carefully we must consider it, always observing that it is a lawful area, not a region of mysteries or enchantments, not a fantastic uh, dwelling place of monsters, nor a world of fairy tales and nightmares. This invisible world is actually the greater part of existence. For if man could estimate the terms of what he knows in terms of that which is to be known, he would realize how very little he has accomplished. Man is still living in a very small area of light in an infinite region of uncertainties. Metaphysics begins usually with what is commonly known as ontology. An ontology is that general branch of learning which deals with the effort to discover the nature of being. It seeks the answer to the question, who am I? It also seeks to go beyond this point and to discover, if possible, that being, substance, essence, or nature, which is at the root of existence, and which must be assumed to exist. Now, this comes to one of the first points of possible conflict between science and philosophy. Uh, philosophy, particularly metaphysics, insists that it is the only reasonable solution uh, to the mystery of existence is that this mystery is suspended from being, from a fact of some kind. This fact is unknown and invisible. And whether we regard it as a substance or an essence, a creature or a force of some kind, there has to be, according to the reasonable concept of man, a reasonable power at the source of existence. If there is no such reasonable power, if reason does not exist in space, it is not conceivable that it can exist in man. Man cannot be a unique creature. Neither his magnitude nor his attainment justifies such arrogance. Therefore, every condition, state, or quality which exists partially in man must exist totally in the universe itself. So the ontology in its effort to establish the nature of being can follow either the scientific point of view, which seeks to restate the question, or can head straight into uh, the metaphysical uh, problem which seeks to answer the question. Uh, when science approaches the question, who am I? Science takes usually the ground that this question in this form is unanswerable. Therefore, it amends the question. Instead of who am I, it tells us that the ultimate possible uh, answerable question about man is, what am I? When we say, what am I, we then move into a discussion of the attributes or qualities of man, of what is he composed, what makes up his nature, what is the root or substance of his own personal existence. Science has some answers for this what, but no answer for the who. Science takes another important question and handles it in a very similar way. Science says that there is no answer to the ultimate question, why? Why is anything? 
The average five-year-old child beginning to become aware of the mystery of existence has a certain audacity that has not been tempered by experience. Therefore, small children ask the question, why? They want to know why their parents act as they do. As the parent does not know, the question is extremely difficult. So science helping distracted parents and contributing what it can to the smothering of young minds takes the attitude that we cannot answer the question, why? Therefore, as one professor said, when we say why, we mean how. Now, why he didn't say how seems to be a little dim. But at the same time, we are supposed to automatically exchange one word for the other. How opens a different kind of world. We can answer the question, how is man formed, if we are willing to limit this to the study of the prenatal epic. We know how he came into existence if we want to uh, go a little further and examine into the fertilization of the ovum. But when we ask forthrightly, why, this is much more difficult. How we got here up to a point is understandable. Why we are here in the first place is unknowable. Now, science does not like to deal with unknowables. They are always embarrassing wherever they occur. Therefore, in order to retain a certain complacency, it has narrowed the area. It has built a wall between physics and metaphysics and forbade anyone to look over the wall. If you look over the wall, you are a sickly mystic. If you dare to go beyond the circumference which has been established by formal techniques, you are then uh, held to have lost your scientific orientation and to be wandering about in a sea of conflicting absurdities. This, however, does not entirely discourage philosophy although I think we can say that it has discouraged most 20th century philosophers. They say old Professor Jowett uh, of Oxford was the last man who was not discouraged by this particular situation. With him, universal knowledge is said to have perished. But the fact remains that man has been endowed with the power to ask the unpleasant questions. He has been given, even in his childhood, uh, the courage to ask the basic why. He has also been given the faculties which will not rest until he is able to penetrate the obvious and come to some uh, deeper insight into the substance of his own nature. Reason will attack head-on problems that science has not the courage to assail. Science, therefore, assumes that reasonable procedures have no foundation in scientific procedure. Aristotle denies this when he affirms that the reason is a scientific instrument the most complete and perfect of all instruments. For without it, every other instrument either fails or could never have been devised. Yet if we take all other instruments away, reason itself remains and can reconstruct anything that has ever existed and fashion anything that is yet necessary. For it is not well to sell reason short. It is better to try to understand that reason naturally deals with either physical or moral abstractions and must bring them into order 
and must create the codes and concepts which govern all specialized knowledge. Feeling from the ontological point of view, therefore, but, uh, metaphysics deals first with the nature of being. Uh, can being be defined? The answer is, can man be defined? If anything which exists can be defined, then being which is existence can be defined. What we cannot accomplish is a blanket definition. We cannot create a definition that exhausts the potential of being. But we can establish a certain basic concept. First of all, a thing to exist must be. If anything exists, the principle of being exists. There can be no escaping this rather obvious but neglected truism. Being is therefore an establishment in time, place, or space. Being is something which has of itself an endurance. Reason has never been able to accomplish a thoughtful apperception of a condition or time in which being did not exist. Nor can we rationally uh, comprehend any time in which being ceases to exist. Being by its very nature can have no beginning nor can it have an end. If it had a beginning, we are utterly defeated for the reason that if there is a beginning to that which is primordial, eternal, and unchanging, if this had a beginning, it could never have existed because there is nothing from which being itself could descend. If being, therefore, is not eternal, it could not be, for there is nothing from which it could be generated. If it was generated from itself, we are in the same dilemma, for then being could only be generated from being, and we are right where we started from, that being itself is eternal. We cannot assume or conceive that being can end. For that which ends must have had a beginning. These are the re requisites. Uh, we used to refer in theological studies to what has been called the theological one-ended stick, but we do not hold it in great regard. This uh, one-ended stick is something that starts as a beginning and then goes on forever and ever. This is the one-ended stick, and there is no such a thing. But consequently, when we say that being comes into existence or tries, or we try to assume that the uncreate, the continuing unchangingness, if we assume that this uh, comes into so-called existence, we must then affirm that existence is only one of the aspects of being, and that being apparently is created simply because it changes its appearances but not its substances. In something emanating from being, which we have not previously known or seen, comes into the area of our physical comprehension we say this thing was created, or that it has come in some way out of the everywhere into the here and is with us. But this cannot be assumed to me. 
that this thing which we first comprehend at a certain state of its own existence began where the comprehension began, or had no existence prior to the time in which we could comprehend it. Thus, ontology is confronted with a very severe choice. Being is either forever or for never. Now, if we assume that being is for never, that there is no such thing as being, we take a very absurd position because we wipe out ourselves along with everything else. And as one observer in the philosophical world once said rather pathetically, that if we could actually eliminate ourselves, we could explain everything. <laughs> but this does not seem to be very convenient either. Consequently, we finally come to the conclusion that man, is a as a creature, has the power to conceive within himself the existence of a nature abiding forever in eternity, permeating, penetrating all things, having in itself an in inevitable continuum, and that this thing which exists must properly be termed being, essence, or substance. We say that it is essence because it is the most subtle part of all things. We say that it is substance because it is the only endurance, as Plato points out. That which has the greatest endurance has the greatest substance and reality, although we cannot perceive it. So ontology, certainly in the classical period, came to the rather quiet and actually irrefutable position uh, that the universe, cosmos, the vast galaxies of stars, the vast expanse of the Milky Way and others extending to infinity beyond our comprehension, choir after choir of angelic forces, all of these exist within and of being. They are. Therefore, being is. Being is. Therefore, they are. Having established this, we establish the ultimate reservoir of condition. For being becomes not only the total reality, but it becomes the total substance and source of all that exists. There is no longer any problem of creation being fashioned out of nothing. The old Rosicrucian adage, nothing from nothing comes, uh, appeals at this moment. Everything arises in something. Nothing arises in nothing. And because all things do arise, and we behold this vast expanse of existence, we therefore say, that it arises from being, it originates in being, it is perpetuated by being, it is nourished and sustained from the substance of being, and when it appears to disappear, vanish away, or cease to exist, it has merely returned again uh, to the essence of being itself. Thus we no longer have an empty space dotted with creation. We have an infinite life uh, surrounding and penetrating all so-called space and sustaining this infinite diversity of manifestation within itself. 
Once we solve this problem to the best of our ability, and reason seems to convey to us that we have approached as nearly as we can to the ultimate hypothesis, we now hypothecate a universe of infinite supply, a universe which contains within itself all that is necessary for itself. And that this uh, continually renewing existence uh, renews from the totality of its own available elements, principles, and essences. The second point that comes to uh, the metaphysical consideration is not so much what we shall call this ultimate, this absolute this unconditioned. But we must now move this unconditioned from its own eternal subsistence to what we might call a state of activity. In other words, how does the infinite, for any reason whatsoever, curtail its own infiniteness? because it becomes obvious that universals give rise in themselves to particulars. By what peculiar power does this universal variously restrict itself, condition itself, partition itself, and cause to arise from its own totality uh, the phenomenon of parts? The ancients held this to be uh, perhaps one of the deepest of all mysteries. And there have been several efforts to explain it. Perhaps Aristotle's explanation was as good as any other. He probably derived it at least in part from the older fragments of the Pythagorean lore. Now, Aristotle takes the ground, the being, because it is totality contains inevitably within itself what might be termed an archetypal nature. Plato's doctrine of archetypes appears here. Being, though infinite, is still in a mysterious way a being. Being, because it is total, is the only creature, creation, or power, or substance, that has total knowledge. Not knowledge of a mental nature, not knowledge as we know it, not thought or mind as we understand these things, but a total existence in which none of these attributes is deficient. Being is therefore the ultimate of mind. It is the ultimate of substance. It is the ultimate of essence. It is the ultimate of process. And it is conceivable, at least Aristotle so held the conception, perhaps following Plato's definition of the divine animal. Plato and Aristotle are in rather close agreement, therefore, that this being, this essence, is not a pa apart from law, but possesses or holds within itself not only substances but processes. The ultimate processes of all things are therefore an infinite pattern residing forever in the infinite itself. This infinite pattern arises not from mind, but mind from the pattern. This is why the Egyptians and some of the Oriental peoples point out clearly that it is the thought that produces the thinker and not the thinker who produces the thought. What we call the thinker is a process in the unfoldment of the process of the thought itself. So the concept, uh, sub uh, simply stated, is this, that all of the conditions that arise in being are inevitable because being itself is inevitable and contains all inevitability are comparatively patient and not particularly well-recognized Tibetan brothers 
not too numerous, far from our ken of knowledge and science and all these things, have stated it very simply, but perhaps as wisely as any other group that ever existed, namely that there is a periodicity in the archetype of existence. Through existence means vast motions that are essentially part of its own nature. As the body of man carries within it the circulation of the blood, as the vast pageantries of the universe result in the mutations of seasons, as the tides are variously controlled, as all things have an ebbing and flowing of themselves, whether it be the ebbing and flowing of waking and sleeping, or of life or death, or of growth or decay, or of coming forth and declining or retiring from manifestation. These principles, reason tells us, have their final abidance in being itself. Therefore, being is capable of causing to arise in itself, or perhaps in the Hindu thought, thought more accurately, is unable to prevent the rise within itself of the great cycles of periodicity. Consequently, being is of its nature infinitely and totally fruitful and is constantly bearing fruit, this fruit being the harvest of the world, as the old wisdom of the Hebrew elders has pointed out to us. So to explain creation, we simply realize that creation is an eternal process, that creation is part of the foreverness of being, that there was never a time when creation was not, that all creations as such, like all men as such, have their beginnings and their ends. But just as all men uh, must perhaps limit their years to four or five score, yet humanity never ends. This is because of the infinite creativity of life, constantly replacing that which vanishes away, and therefore constantly continuing although the particular instruments of continuance may change. So to eternity of being as such, we add the eternity of process as such. We add to this concept, then, that creativity is forever, that never the time it was not, and there is never a time when it shall cease. Yet everything moving within this vast process, except being itself, has a continuance only in time, having a beginning and an end. And this beginning is in being, and the end is in being. But being itself continues to manifest from itself infinite life forever. This brings them to the minds of the ancients who devised these problems the next important consideration, and that is the nature of God. Shall we assume that God is identical with being? We have here two distinct points of view. Here we have the emergence of other phases or factors in the potential totality of the essence of being. Being is of a manifold nature, uh, yet of all of the things which it contains within itself, the forces, powers, principles, and energies, resident in it. 
There is one most mysterious, primordial, as difficult to define as being itself, and as some have held co-eternal with being, or at least, if not co-eternal, the first and inevitable production of being. And to this, the ancients applied the term consciousness. Now, consciousness uh, really means awareness. We are not assured that in its own essence and substance, being is aware. But we do know that it produces from itself infinite awareness. And that this infinite awareness always finally turns toward the conscious experience of the nature of the infinite itself. This awareness, therefore, in man, is the awareness of himself. He may be aware of this, but he cannot examine the object of his awareness. In the universe, consciousness is the eternal awareness of the nature and existence of being. But this awareness may or may not be capable of understanding itself. But consciousness becomes, so to say, the symbol of the objectivity of being. The first manifestation of being is infinite consciousness. An infinite consciousness carries within it its own substance or nature, with which it is also co-identical. For an infinite consciousness is therefore one with infinite life. Life consciousness being uh, terms for the aspects of one thing. Consciousness in itself is life. Consciousness in its manifestation is awareness, or the power of life to bestow upon creatures the sense of self-existence. So the ancients came to the conclusion that if we would properly and definitely define a deity, we must assume that God is primordial consciousness. It is the primordial self-knower arising from the eternally unknown. The self-knower, however, cannot, as far as we can comprehend at least, be actually capable of knowing its own source. God is therefore like the Scandinavian All-Father, the great uh, culture hero uh, Odin. And where we are told in the ancient sagas that Odin, the god of the world, knew everything except his own nature and his own fate. This he could not know. These things were beyond him. But deity represents the island of consciousness arising in the great ocean of being. This island of consciousness comes forth according to the infinite law that being is forever flowing into manifestation through a focal area set up, which is called consciousness. And the primary end of consciousness is that it shall expound, define, restrict, limit, and, and reveal that which is the law of being itself. Therefore, consciousness becomes the basis of the power to interpret the processes arising from being. This is the way the ancients uh, sought to explain this. And this covers that phase of our subject which is essentially referred to as ontology. Anyone can argue these points to the end of time. It is perfectly possible 
for the most ignorant person uh, to deny that which he can neither define nor comprehend. It is perfectly possible to take this mysterious void, uh, which is the extreme apex of metaphysics, and declare it to contain whatever we will that it should contain, or that it shall not contain anything that we will that it shall not contain. But the fact remains that whether we recognize or accept or do not recognize or deny, we in no way alter the nature of being itself. Whatever it is, that it is. And from that, thatness, comes everything that exists. So we then pass to the next branch of our subject, which is the nature of knowledge and of truth. And here, I think we have already somewhat anticipated our situation. Knowledge and truth represent two uh, expressions of a thing. We assume that knowledge is true. That which is not true is not knowledge, said our old friend Dr. Jelly. And uh, we also assume that the end of knowledge is that we shall know that which is true. We then come to a very interesting problem in metaphysics, which is summarized in the famous question asked by Pilate at the time when Christ was brought before him. He looked at the Nazarene and he asked the question, what is true? And the Nazarene was silent. Truth, therefore, is the ultimate abstraction of all knowledge to the point that knowledge itself is united with being. Therefore, truth is ultimately the perfect and complete knowledge of being. Not only its substance, but its processes. Under such absolute terms, Truth is the thing in its absolute nature. Truth is that which is, regardless of seeming or appearing. Truth is therefore that which can penetrate all seemingness, or things as they appear to be, to the discovery of absolute reality as it actually is. The truth of a thing is therefore the total fact of the thing. Its nature, its essence, its substance, its purpose, its origin, and its destiny. Under such condition, truth is not overly abundant. But what we commonly refer to as the truth is merely the fact of a thing on the level of physics, not on the level of metaphysics. Yet a fact bears witness in a strange, shadowy way to a truth. And that which is a fact in matter must be a truth in energy. So we have this nature of truth itself and how man may or should regard himself as capable of participating in truth. The answer lies that at the abstraction of metaphysics, at the ultimate of essence itself, or being, we have that which is. Between that and the present state of man with his imperfect faculties is the universe of things as they seem to be. Wisdom dictates that man must gradually penetrate seemingness must gradually outgrow delusion by appearance. 
must ultimately overcome any prejudice, conceit, or deceit within his own nature by which his judgment or his reason may be impaired. And it is then assumed that to the degree that man is absolutely reasonable, he comes closer to that which is absolutely true. He will not reach it because he cannot be absolutely reasonable. But he can improve his present lot considerably by even a modicum of hard mental exercise. He can know much more that is true than he now knows. And he can also re rescue himself from addiction to that which is not true, which he has not yet learned to recognize as not true. So we have in our second problem this effort to define truth. If being exists, truth exists, because truth and being must be regarded finally as qualities exceedingly similar, if not identical. <coughs> if there is a being, this being can be known, and that knowing is truth. But at any given time, or under, at any given condition, the creatures evolving within the substance of being, and possessing incomplete and imperfect faculties, may not be able to experience the actual fact of truth itself. So we are truth seekers, or we are wisdom lovers which is the friendliness toward wisdom, which is the meaning of the term philosophy or philosophia. Friendship for <coughs> truth. But we cannot claim that we possess it. But if being exists, we cannot deny that truth exists. Therefore, we must gradually, as we can, overcome the interval or reduce the interval between our own comprehension and the essential reality that can conceivably be comprehended. This takes us to that phase of the problem which we say the nature of knowledge. The nature of knowledge is the nature of the attained. And what an individual knows may be considered as the substance of his attainment. Knowledge is relative. Truth is finally infinite or absolute. Consequently, it is not possible for us really to refer to relative truth, although we do it. What we really mean, probably, is that we are dealing with relative degrees of knowledge for the truth itself cannot change. That part of truth which we comprehend, we call knowledge. Therefore, a knowing person is a person who knows something about truth, but does not know truth per se. A person of knowledge is a person who has become familiar or expert in some area, which is itself an area of truth. Actually, Philosophy does not recognize any essential difference between sacred and profane knowledge. The individual who learns the Latin language is learning something which in one way or another is an attainment in knowledge toward truth. Something is conferred here, more than the mere ability to speak a language. All mastery of things unknown or unmastered may be considered advancement toward universal knowledge. For knowledge is that part which we do know, and upon knowledge we have built the civilization and universe as we comprehend it today. It is knowledge that has given us our arts and sciences, our industries, our crafts, and our trades. It is knowledge which has given us a certain expertness on the, in the areas where physics itself operates. 
It is knowledge also which has caused us to extend the sovereignty of our own purposes as far as possible out into the universal existence. It is knowledge that may sometime land a spaceship on the moon or on the distant planet. But all this knowledge is on a level, and it is within the area of physics. In other words, it is in the area of material things which to some degree at least are comprehended by the concrete faculties of the mind. We are extending our search out further and further along these rays that seem to emanate from absolute truth itself. Each of these is a pathway. We begin at the outer extremity or circumference of this radiance and move gradually toward its center. Uh, that which uh, we have yet not reached, we look forward to and approach in terms of the unknown. That which we have conquered, that which we have mastered, that which we have transformed from the state of being unknown to the state of being known, we call knowledge. So as we proceed, knowledge increases. Theoretically, that brings us closer to universal knowing. Thus we may say simply that all true knowledge must be in conformity with the laws of being, must be a revelation of being in one of its conditioned aspects, and therefore by specialization one of us may go further in music and another in art. But all of these accomplish are possible because of being, and being is released, released or revealed in some way through all of the conditioned accomplishments which are possible in nature or for man. So for simple purposes, the truth is divided into the known and the unknown. The known is knowledge. The unknown is the vast area yet to be conquered by the material powers of man to a certain point and, by, and beyond that by the rational, reasonable, intuitive, or inspirational powers of man. Now this carries us naturally to the next point. What is energy? To the classical thinker, energy is simply a conditioned kind of life. Life within itself is like a great ocean. Life in itself has its currents and its tides and its seasons. But in, in its own nature, it is in eternal suspension. But when life, for one purpose or another, is caused to be objectified when, when this life principle itself becomes the mover of things. When this life principle begins its vast pattern of circulation by means of which it causes things to have existences within being, we call this energy. Energy is the power within the thing by which it lives. And the particular problem of energy is therefore the aliveness of a thing and the expansion of that thing from within itself by processes of growth by which we also imply processes of evolution and ultimately processes of generation, or the transmission of life uh, from one generation to the next. Energy, therefore, is that by which we are internally vitalized. Now, if in the course of this, this energizing, the individual is caused or moved to an action, 
This action becomes an aggressive expression of energy. And where energy is turned from the self to that which is not the self, as in the conquest of environment, or as a means of preserving or perpetuating its physical existence in a universe of conflicting energy. When this occurs, when energy moves the thing rather than moving within the thing, we term energy force. Force, therefore, is a conditioned energy. Force is energy which is being revealed or released by an aggressive motion or an aggressive procedure. Energy in, is moved into a forceful relationship with things. It is released by an action of the, of the will. And uh, the will, therefore, may be a best explained, perhaps, much as Schopenhauer explained it along Buddhist lines, when he points out that the will is the director of the use of energy, that the will itself is floated upon energy, and that in the accomplishment of its own purpose, will transforms energy into force. And that by which men live becomes transformed into that by which men do, or create, or fashion, or modify their own existence in relationship to other things. So the uh, problem of life moving into the form of energy sets up the metaphysical universe. Energy moving into the state of force sets up the physical universe. Therefore, over the physical universe, the Greeks place the Demiurgus, the deity Zeus, whose symbol was the thunderbolt, and who represents the principle of force used to bring forth an orderly condition, which is the empire of the gods. Uh, force, therefore, is the prince of the material world against which Jesus turned. Uh, force is that uh, phase of man's energy expansion by means of which he sets up his own kingdom in the abyss. Or, if we wish to be less thoughtful of that point and go into the Gnostic concept, it is force personified by a mental agent or ensouled by a mental agent that brings forth material creation. Therefore, the mind of the Demiurgus or the mind of the world god, by the use of the thunderbolts, which represent force, takes the primordial essence of the twelve titans, the universal field of energy, and transforms this energy into force, and by force creates and then governs an area set aside for the manifestation of the world a solar system or a cosmos. Man, in turn, in miniature, reproduces this procedure. Thus we say that man may be a spiritually living creature, a mentally energized and a physical creature operating and existing by virtue of force because it takes force to move the blood through the arterial system. It takes force to move the hand. It takes force to play the piano. It takes force to drive a nail. These things represent the activities of body. 
But this force is possible because the mind and the subtler inner life is energized and vitalized. And all this is also possible only because man is a living creature, and that life itself, in its manifestation, breaks up into energy and force and forms another creative triad on a lower level of manifestation from the divine triad. The next point that we wish to make here is of the nature of divine and human relationship. We can't take up the whole study of the uh, seven points of metaphysics, so we limited them to four in our announcement for the evening's work. Now we have a very interesting problem. We have a farmer who goes out and sows a field. And uh, we will say now that the plants which he sows are going to be of great size and that a jungle will arise where he has sown. Now, this jungle is the result of his own soul. But when it grows to its full maturity, man himself can no longer control it. He can no longer find his way through the jungle that he himself has sown. Therefore, we may say also that the uh, seminal principles of existence sown in space by that eternal energy or essence which created the world finally results in the manifestation in space of a formal creation. The creation of suns and moons, of planets, and of asteroids and comets, and a vast and involved chemical situation which lies be below the threshold of our common observance. This world in which we live is a mass of chemical reactions, a mass of energy moving, a tremendous interplay of forces permeated throughout by life, and all of these different manifestations being grounded in essence, substance, and being, so that we have a very complicated procedure. And out of this strange earth into which the seeds of the infinite are sown, there finally grows forth man, who is of the earth earthy and whose uh, creation is allegorically described in the formation of Adam. Man, therefore, is, like all products born of seed, he is alive. In his aliveness, he carries, rooted within the depths of himself, the whole vast mystery of life. By his own very nature, he participates in that very nature which alone is. And in the course of his growth over a vast period of time, this creature, which we call man, has risen from a comparatively helpless and hopeless condition to one of highly developed resources, powers, and potentials. So now we have the point of view shifted. Man has become capable of the experience of self-knowing, and he has also become capable of the experience of God-seeking. He finds himself standing in the presence of a mystery, enveloped by this mystery. Whichever way he turns, it extends from him in every conceivable direction. He finds that he exists within an infinite universe and that he is a very tiny and comparatively insignificant fragment of this universal totality whose body nature is and God the soul. So man, whether he is highly skillful or not, finds himself as an existence within existence. He finds, however, that his existence is restricted largely to the area of his own body, that he cannot escape from this body except by death. 
that he cannot be more than he is at any time, but that he does possess physically, morally, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually the power to grow. Confronted with this concept, the Gnostics, and to a measure the Neoplatonists, develop what is called the system of analogy. That is, they devise the idea of a twofold process taking place constantly in nature. The positive polarity of that process is the motion of the infinite toward finiteness. That forever heaven is moving toward the earth that forever life is becoming embodied, that all spiritual things like the angels described in the book of Enoch are coming down upon the mountains of the earth, that the gods are moving downward, that every force that is truly divine, the great creative processes are droppings, as Plato tells us, like tiny seed from the Milky Way, falling into the mystery of generation, ignorance, and death. These being merely terms for the obscuration of the essential consciousness of these lives. So the ancients felt that there was a great universal motion by which total being was moving inevitably toward the state of being totally embodied. At the same time that this is occurring, these seeds that were planted somewhere in the dark earth of primordial growth and development have been growing upward like plants from the surface of the earth. Therefore, man is a kind of plant growing upward. Man is rooted in the earth, and he is seeking to ascend to the sky. Eternity is rooted in the sky, and is suspended, as Plotinus tells us, like an inverted tree or flower, uh, with its effulgent blossoms revealed through the nature and appearance of the stars. So we have two contrary forces in operation. Man, in a process of perpetual evolution, existing within a universe in which being is in a process of eternal involution. This combination means uh, that being is continually permeating or, or radiating like the sun. And man is continually seeking to ascend and be reunited through growth with the luminous source of himself. Thus man is ascending a ladder of seven rungs, and eternity itself is descending through a world of seven degrees, qualities, spheres, or parts. In the Gnosis, these were represented by emanationism, in which eternity is forever emanating the qualified or conditioned aspects of itself. And man is forever emanating the over parts of his own nature, which are his intuitional and inspirational uh, elements or characteristics. Somewhere... These two meet, and it is the meeting of these two values by means of which heaven and earth are united. It is in this way that the two opposites are reconciled, and as the alchemist said, we produce the mystery of the fire that is fed by water, and the water that is not extinguished for the fire. So we have this common meeting. Man has body, mind, and spirit. The infinite must likewise have spirit, mind, and body. The body of man belongs to the body of the infinite. This is the mind of man is part of the mind of the infinite. 
The spirit of man is derived from the eternal essence of infinite spirit. Man has been so constituted that he can reach a degree of insight in which he can bridge this mysterious interval between the creating power and the created creature. So according to the old beliefs and the ancient <coughs> tradition, uh, there comes a time in which man uh, becomes capable of regaining a point of equilibrium between uh, creator and creation. And this interval between creator and creation is the abode of creature. And man is a creature. The word man is from the ancient Hindu Manas, the thinker. Manu, the lawgiver. So in the emanation theory, man ascending gradually approaches a condition of comprehension. Uh, eternity descending comes gradually near enough to man so that man can comprehend this universal procedure. And it is because these two powers are moving toward each other by eternal law that man himself more or less comes into existence. Because man represents the creature which contains both the creator and the creation. As Paracelsus said, man is bound to the element by his body, to the planet by his soul, to the stars by his spirit. So the spirit in man links him to the eternal. The body of man binds him to the temporal. Between these two, the soul of man, his mental and emotional coordination, acts as the bridge, so that the individual is capable of making the transition of, from the state of not knowing to the state of knowing, because of all creatures which we are capable of knowing or comprehending ourselves. Man is the only one in which there is go a Homer's golden chain which locks the rock of earth and binds it to the pinnacle of Olympus. Man, therefore, has the chain of bodies, the chain of vehicles, without a break. A man is the lowest creation in which this is true. Therefore, man alone has a perfect ladder on which he can ascend from the material to the mystical, from the mystical to the rational, from the rational to the divine. This constitutes his road or his path. And it was held in ancient metaphysics that it's because of this chain of vehicles alone that man is capable of understanding metaphysics. If he did not possess the internal instruments of knowing, he could not even wonder about the reason for himself. But because he possesses these, uh, Plato points out that it is a shame indeed, a great pity under the sun, that possessing this power to know God, man should be willing to live in ignorance and die in ignorance that having values, powers, and potentials by which he is lifted above all other creatures and has the means to attain union with the radiance of the infinite, that he is willing to remain a mole, clinging to the earth, burying within the earth, assuming his blindness to be his proper state, and denying expression continuously to these urges and impulses within himself, which would rebel against his own impotence and would impel him uh, to seek his proper destiny, as described in the mysterious Gnostic hymn of the Robe of Glory. So that uh, we have, in this, in this situation, another point which metaphysics uh, brings out, and that is the strange, incredible, 
unsolvable restlessness in me. The human being is never at peace, never at rest. They're never able to escape from the impulses and the pressures that tear him and in one way or another disturb him. The reason for this restlessness is that man, man's impulses, his life facts, his reality, his energy, all belong to the infinite. Man's natural instinct is like that of the bird, to be free. He wants to rise into the higher air. He wants to spread the wings that have been concealed within the body of clay. He wants to go home. He wants to be part of the great citizenry of space by which he is wonderfully equipped and for which he is destined. Yet in the presence of this tremendous desire to grow, he finds, as Gato says, that there is a self within him which in the earth aspires. There is something in him that binds him also to the trivial, holds him locked within the narrow confines of his earthly cage, and causes him to count as most blessed those situations which most affect him early and contribute to his misery. But man cannot rest because he belongs to the light. He belongs to the ancient road that must bring him finally to the full expression of infinite existence in himself. He must go home. He must be one with the infinite by becoming himself infinite. Thus he cannot endure with complete complacency that which frustrates the complete purpose for his own existence. Thus he is ill at ease. He cannot accept uh, the condition in which he finds himself. He is too big for the world he has accepted and too weak to learn how to escape it. He cannot be satisfied with what he is, but he hasn't the courage to be more. Thus the disciplines of philosophy great schools set up in antiquity for the cultivation of human conduct were intended to instruct man in his eternal destiny, strengthen him in his resolution to claim his proper birthright, and to provide him with the various instruments through the use of which he can achieve that end for which he was destined. These instruments, this process, this insight, and the science involved in the perfection of this part of man, these together constitute the subject of metaphysics. Thank you very much.